Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 15. Unfortunately, sometimes believers in the Bible give you a good example of, of doctrines that, you, that are negative, kind of, in the sense like Saul's reversionism tonight. But he's really a classic example of what it is. And I think if you, if you, we've been paying a lot of attention to him, um, you'll, um, you'll be able to get, I think through him, you get a good look at how reversionism works from the inside of a, of a believer. And, and, um, And how difficult it is when you get deep into reversionism, how, deep, how, how, how difficult it is to get out of it. Now, you can walk your way out of it, but how difficult it is to walk your way out of it. I mean, that's a, that's a bugaboo, and, and this, this one here will show you it in, in Saul, in the life of Samuel, that, you know, Samuel's a, a really interesting guy because... Uh, the first two kings of Israel, uh, he uh, he had to select them and anoint them and teach them and and uh, walk them through what God had in store for their life. And uh, and uh, it's interesting in the Bible, it it talks a great deal about how much uh, Samuel wept over Saul, how much he wept how much he wept over him uh, just not being able to be the guy up to the speed for the and it, it wasn't because he didn't have the capability it's that he wasn't willing to walk by faith wasn't able to walk it out wasn't willing he was capable of it like we all are but just wasn't willing to walk it out in his life so here we are in, in 1 Samuel 15. I'm looking at verses 10 and 11 tonight. The word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret. The word of the Lord came to Samuel and said, I regret that I have made Saul king. Now this is the Lord speaking. I regret that I, I have made Saul king for he has turned back from following me. That phrase turn back from following me is where you get reversionism. It's exactly, it is as good a definition you find anywhere. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Okay? And uh, he's going to be that way till he dies and Saul dies about this. Uh, and it wasn't that he, that Saul, now Saul didn't believe that, Saul, Saul didn't really believe that he had the capabilities of doing it. And he proved that in his own strength and in his own workings, he didn't. And that's what's good about this lesson is that any task God calls you to is greater than anything you could achieve in your flesh. I don't care what it is. And Saul was always a step behind because he thought he always had to accomplish something in the flesh. That, uh, and he never felt up to being able to do that. He had such a, what we call a low self-esteem. He had such a poor opinion of his own ability. Um, say in verse 17, Samuel said, is, is it not true, though, you were little in your own eyes? God promoted you to the head of the tribes. And uh, um, he just never could buy in that, you know, what God had called him, God was able to accomplish it through him. He didn't expect Saul to do it. He expected Saul to submit to him and let him do it through him. That's true with you and me. If you think you're going to go do something for God in the energy of the flesh or in your own ability or in your own thinking, in your own whatever, 
you're going to fail. You might as well, you might as well stay put because you're going to fail. And if you, if you think you succeed, it's because others have told you, not God. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to talk about Saul. And what Samuel, what the Lord told Samuel to tell Saul about reversionism, why it was dangerous. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin if necessary. It will be necessary if there could be awareness in your life of mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. These should be confessed in silence according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That takes us back to the work of Christ on the cross, not for our salvation, but for our sanctification. When we confess our sin, we're back into spiritual positions where God can work with us through the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And what a privilege that is. So I give you that moment as a believer priest out of 1 Peter 2 to take that moment. Well, Father, we're thankful to be here tonight and with these group that have come by automobile and those who are visiting with us by the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. Cannot be learned in the flesh. Can't be learned nor lived in the flesh. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit and why we're told to walk in the power of the Spirit by faith. By faith, not by sight. By the Holy Spirit, not by flesh. We pray that today over this study and those who are listening and with an ear to hear, to believe, to apply. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Lord gave King Saul... A detailed assignment. We call it the details of the directive will of God. And he was going to send him on a military assault upon the uh, Amalekites. And you're familiar with this. This is a 400-year-old program that God, God has, this Malachite deal. And, and God is now about to use a man uh, in the authority of a nation to discipline a nation. Okay? He's going to use Saul, first king of a nation, to discipline another nation. Saul listens to the generality of the word of God and not to the details. And I'm telling you today, when you're a baby, you can get away from that. When you're a baby believer, you can get away with listening to the general things that God says to you, and not the specifics. You can get a little bit away from it, not as much, when you're an immature believer. But when you're a mature believer who believes that you are securing your salvation based on the word of God about your salvation, can't get away with that anymore. He's going to hold you accountable for the details of the will of God as much as the general view on it. And we knew, as we saw Saul go out and had victory, came back and said, I don't understand why everybody's so upset. I was told to go out and conquer them. I went out and conquered them. And I can't understand why everybody's upset. And he said, well, because you didn't do what you were told to do. And he says, I don't understand why you keep saying that. I destroyed that nation. And so he says, well, I hear animals. Be me, me, moo, moo, bark, bark, whatever. And what is that I hear? Well, we brought some of the very, we destroyed everything that wasn't any good and everything that was good we brought back. Were you told that that was okay to do? No. What were you told? Karam. I was told Karam. And what? What was, how was it delivered to you? In the hip field. How many times did God tell you that? Six. And the word means to utterly destroy. And then he went into the details and told him exactly what he meant by that. Right? I mean, right down to the last thing that God thought about it. As a result of not being obedient 
to the details of the directive will of God, he's in big trouble with the Father. He's in big trouble with the Father. So I wrote the Hebrew word for utterly destroy on the top of your paper. You're reading from the right to the left. That's C-H-A-R-A-M. I put it on your paper, C-H-A-R-M. It's in the hip field. And the hip field is what we call causative. And causative is interesting when God is speaking. Because you're going to get the desires of God that must be yours. Whatever God's desire is, he wants your desire to motivate you. The desire of God. Listen, the desire of God should motivate you about everything. If you're a spiritual mature believer, then everything is about the desire of God. And the desire of God should be your desire. And the hip field, when the hip field is used, it speaks that volume to you. It, that's the way it speaks to you. And they, in the Hebrew, they, cause it, they call it causative. Okay? Causative. And it, and it deals with the motive or the desire behind it. it, it the, see, people, look, when you're a baby believer, you hear the word of God. You don't pay attention to how God is speaking it to you. You don't pay any attention to that. No baby does that. But over time, the baby comes oriented to the voice. And as they begin to mature, when they be, get out of babyhood and get into that, then they begin to pay attention to body language and the sound, uh, the wor the sound that are with words. Do you understand me? What I'm saying? We all been through this. Uh, maybe a while ago, but <laughs> we've all gone, gone through that stage. And what you what you have just entered into is not just the words of your parent, but the desire of your parent. The motives and ideas and desires, you've picked up on that. Um, later, you, you begin to work that out in the way you deal with people by body language, right? A tone orientation, all these words are like that. Well, this is the power of the word. This is the power of the hip field in Hebrew. Th this is what's behind all that. And it's called causative. For those who are taking Hebrew class with us, you ought to be paying attention to this. All right? And so the word utterly destroyed. It's used in verse 3 when the instructions is given to him in detail. Go, now go, strike Amalek, utterly destroy all that he had. Now, now he describes it in detail. Uh, put to death man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, donkey, etc. I mean, that's about as clear as it gets. Now, he uses this word uh, for utterly destroy. He uses it in the hip field. Every time it's used in chapter 15, it's in the hip field. It's used in verse 3, 8, 9, 15, 18, and 20. That's a whole lot of times. Because everybody got it but, but Saul. <laughs> the one guy that's supposed to get it didn't get it. And you know why? Because he wasn't listening. He didn't listen. Oh, he heard But he didn't listen. You know why? Because a person like this has already made up their mind that they're going to do what they're going to do no matter what the person in authority tells them anyhow. You have a child like that? Then you know what I'm talking about. You're, you, have a, you have a living example of it in your life. No matter what you tell them. They may, they may salute you and be very positive about it, and they may say, oh, I agree with you. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. They, they have no intention to do it, and they're not going to do it. In fact, Jesus tells a parable about two children in a, in a family where one is, they're both told to go work, and one says, yes, I will go, and doesn't go, and the other one says, no, I'm not going, and goes. Which one did the will of the Father? Say to me. So I wasn't looking for answers. I was just telling you what the story was. Saul didn't carry out the details of the directive will of God because of reversionism. This is how reversionism works. It already has a mindset, I'm not going to do it. 
And, it, and listen, whatever you told them to do, if it doesn't work their schedule or what they want, if their desires trump yours. And I'm going to tell you, if you have a child like that, you've got your hands full, and that child's going to get whipped a lot in life. Because that's an attitude that will not work. And, and, and parents know that. And so they try to rein them in and everything. Because they know, you go out there and do this in, quote, the real world, which they already are in, but when they get out there and they don't have that lenient authority that loves them and cares for them and willing to give them a second, third, fourth, 26, 7,000 time, they get whacked. They're going to get whacked. Well, anyhow, Saul is this guy. He's got this mindset. Uh, his work's a little different than the rebellion kids because he's a passive guy. Oh, I, no, I can't do it. I, I'm just, uh, I can't do it. I, I, I'm just, a, you know, he was like 6'8". <laughs> I'm, I'm just a little peewee guy. I mean, what can I do? Well, you could play center on a basketball team. Oh, I can't do that. I, I'm just a little guy. Listen, that's all right because God is greater. I mean, if you've got that attitude, surrender it to the Lord because he's as big as you get. I mean, you, it doesn't matter if you're big or small. You can hide in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation anyhow. Well, as a result of this reversion, Saul gets into severe discipline. And all of it is to correct him. All of it is to correct him. Get him back on the track. Get him back... Get him back into some kind of stable position in his relationship with God. Listen, when your relationship is not right with God, it's not right with anybody. Unless they're out in the Thule's too. Now, if they're out in the Thule's, then you found somebody where you're both going to, the boat's going to sink and both you're going to drown. But if that's kind of a boat you want to ride in with that kind of a captain, well, there you go. But listen, God, that God is not, he, that's not his ship and he's not that captain. That's not his intent. He disciplines because he loves you and wants, to get, wants you back in the plan. The plan that has, has your best interest in his heart all the time. But listen, his best interest for you, you've got to realize his best interest for me is my best interest for me. You know, in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 19, what, don't you know your body's the temple of God? Verse 20, you've been bought with a price. You are not your own. <laughs> That's what Calvary did for you. Took away your sins and gave you new ownership. Somebody could really rule your life in a correct way. The smarter you learn that, the better off you're going to be. Well, I'm going to look at five things tonight about Saul's reversionism because this is a classic example of taking a good look at reversionism, in my opinion. Paul's reversionism is based on Jewish age dispensation. And in, our, in the 15th chapter of Samuel, which is, a great, in my opinion, a great example of it, he gives, six, he gives five characteristics of reversionism out of the life of Saul, who is in the midst of it. You can't get better example than that. In, in, verse, 5, in verse 11, chapter 15, verse 11, there's a great definition. Reversionism is described. Reversionism is described. And it, he says, I regretted that I've made Saul king. And then he says, for, and this is a reason, for he has turned back from following me. That is reversionism. The Hebrew word is shuv. That, that is the word, shuv, is the word for uh, turning, turning, a turning of your life, or a returning, a, a turning. Then what is interesting, and I'm going to show you this because I have some people in the Hebrew class and this will be important for them. If the rest of you use, it will be important for you too. I'm going to show you this. 
Because it's important. Because that's the over here. I didn't give you that word, but that's shuv. Okay, that's the verb. Shuv. It's a hif. It's a. I don't know if it's hif field. It's um. It's a cow perfect. The shuv here is a is a a cow perfect. I'm trying to quit using a K and go back to Q. Um, that right there is a preposition, and that's a suffix. And that right there, X, you know, which is silent, CH, R, this is the word back. From back following it, and here's how the writers translated it. They translated it, for he has turned, he has turned, here's our verb, from following me. That's the suffix. That's a preposition. That's an adverb. And that's a suffix, me. From following me. He has turned back from following me. That's how that, from back from following me is right there. Return from back from following me. It's only two words in the Hebrew, but it takes all that in English. And that's reversionism. And who, and, 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 and who is the me? Look, look, look at this again. I, mean, I don't want you to get all carried away with the Hebrew and miss the English in this thing. Who is the me? God, it's the Lord, right? And that, that is absolutely what reversionism is. And what, what he's after is to get him to return to him. He has stopped following the Lord. He wants him to turn back and follow him. And at some point, the Father is going to intervene. You know, there's the directive will, the permissive will of God, and the overruling will of God. The directive will has been given to him. God has allowed him with volition, permissive will, to do. And at some point, he steps in and goes like, enough enough. Because you're not going to screw up the plan. You want to screw up your life? Okay, but you're not going to screw up my plan. And he's going to do that with every one of us. If you, think, if you think that he don't operate this way, you're wrong. And so he steps in. He steps in with discipline on that, trying to get you to confess your sin and to get you to return. To reverse your life, reverse your course. That's the name of the game. And there it is in the Hebrew. I mean, that's, that's dynamite. I regret that I've made King Saul, Saul King, for he has turned back from following me. That is reversionism. That's where the whole definitional idea comes from. He has not carried out my commands. And Saul's going to push back. In verse 11, that's going to be clear. And Saul's going to push back and say, that's not true. I did do that. <laughs> then what's that? <laughs> See? Then what's that? That's a visual aid, wasn't it? I don't think so. I don't think so. God doesn't think so. Because the details are as important as the directive. These are the details of the directive will. And they're important to God. Right? And listen, if you think that somehow you can maneuver this whole deal, well, if I just kind of if I just kind of do it a little ways for God, then a little bit with God means a lot. I don't know where that comes from. You're supposed to do His will. How much of His will He reveals is how much He requires of it. I can't tell you, boy. You know, you love the Word of God. Now you're into it, and the Word is into you. Now you're held accountable. You're held to a standard. You're held to a standard. He's not going to be slack on that standard because you got the maturity to handle it. you got the maturity to know that everything, listen, what I lack, God makes up. No, no. God's 100% the operator. It's not 40% it's not me and 60% God, and that's grace. That's not how this stuff works. It's not how it works. You think that's the way it works. I know that's the way you think. And that's why your life is in a mess. But that's not grace. 
Grace is 100% God and zero you. Therefore, you have to walk in the power of the Spirit, not in the flesh. It's not 80% of Spirit and 20% flesh. You walk by faith, not sight. It's, it's not an 80-20. It's a 100-0. Well, I'll walk a little by faith and a little bit by sight. Jeez. You know why you won't listen to me? Because you already brought an attitude with you in here that says, well, listen, I hear a lot of guys, and what makes him right and 26 other guys wrong? I'll tell you what does. The Word of God. The Word of God. That's what. Well, they teach the Bible. I don't know. Maybe they're right. Then we're on the same page. I mean, bring your Bible. If I'm wrong, bring it and show it to me. You better do your homework, but bring it and show it to me. I'm open to the Word of God. I want the truth of the Word of God. I got anything set in stone in my life except the Word of God. Now look, there's reversionism. You understand that? That's as clear a picture of reversion you're ever going to get in your life. And that's exactly what it says in the Hebrew. In verse 19, we're going to find two more characteristics. Disobedience and evil. Because once you get into reversionism, you're into disobedience. And let me tell you where the devil's taking you. He's going to take you right out of sin and into evil. That's where he's at it. If I can get you to sin, I got a hook in your nose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag you all the way till I get you into evil. When I get you into evil, you, you, can't, you can't paddle your way out of it. That's what, that's what he believes you believe. I mean, sin is easy to deal with. Evil isn't. We know that with ICE. This ISIS group, they're the... They, they are the epitome of evil. And it amazes me to watch the news and people don't know that. And they criticize people who call that evil. Let me tell you, if it's their child that that maniac killed, if it was their child that they is going to go bury because of that evil, they'd have a different opinion. You need to have that different opinion before it comes to your street, knocks on your door, and enters your house. I tell you, America's had a wonderful divine hedge around it for years and years and years. And let me tell you, our defense system, spiritually defense system, is not as good as it's always been. And everybody knows it, but they don't know that the hedge has been a spiritual defense system that's been around America because of the church of Jesus Christ has been on top of their game. And you can tell when the defense system isn't working right is because we're not on top of our game. We've become a weak country because the church is weak and anemic. They are a lot of see ya. So why do you, and, he, and so here's two more signs of reversionism in, in operation. Disobedience and evil. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? That's counseling. Right there, now we're into counseling. Well, I went and did a, I've been a, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, I still hear it. Why did you, not obey the voice of the Lord. Why did you rust upon the spoils? You know what that, you know what that idea is? Goody, oh, goody, goody, goody. Look what I got to take home to my daddy. You better not be taking anything home to daddy. You understand? Because daddy said don't bring nothing home. And they rushed upon the spoils. And they're just like little giddy kids. And they're bringing all these back. I destroyed all the weak, bad animals, and I brought all the good ones to worship God with. And you know what God's going to call it? Idolatry. Bring me pagan stuff. You bring me pagan stuff. 
And then he says, thirdly, and, and did, why did you not obey? Why did you rush upon the spoils? And why did you do evil in the sight of God? You know what that means? That means up in his face. That's what we say. Up in your face. In his sight means in your face. You know, you got really serious trouble, don't you? When your kid gets in your face with their rebellion. You know you got trouble. If you don't know you got trouble, you're out to lunch. And it's dinner time. Do you know what's going to happen when that child gets married? If it's a boy, he's going to go to jail. If it's a girl, she's, she's going to go to the hospital. That's what's going to happen to them. That's called the real world. Because you know they're going to marry a slug. Jeez. Better rescue them now because they're going to be a place where you can't rescue them. You can't rescue them. They're adults and you can't rescue them. Until they're flat on their face or in a gurney or, or someplace else. Now here's some other characteristic. This is, this is when reversionism is in display. Rebellion and insubordination. Samuel says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. That you how big sacrifice was? Listen, and listen, Saul is coming back just giddy over that he's won of great victory. <laughs> He's has got the bad group behind him. And he's just giddy about it. And he's brought him back to worship the Lord. You can't worship the Lord and deny his will all through your life and then think you're going to worship God with all of that in you without getting rid of it. It's not going to happen. Just because you go to church is not going to get, that's not worship just because you go to church. You got to have a pure heart. You've got to have a pure heart. You can't worship God without a pure heart, a cleansed heart, one that's been purged through Christ. We, we're the goofiest group of people today. I'm not just talking about us. I am, but I'm talking about more. As a, as a Christian church today in America, we're goofy. We think, we think we worship if the music has got a good beat to it, then we worship we don't pay any attention to the words. If we did, we wouldn't sing them nine times out of ten. Rebellion and insubordination. Then he goes on to say, for rebellion, which you're demonstrating, is sin of divination. It's a sin of divination, he says. And insubordination is iniquity and idolatry. Do you know why he's saying that? Because these things are equal to what God hates. These are the things that God hates because they destroy people's life for which Christ came to rescue. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. This is the stuff that has flown out of, that has flowed out of Saul's life because he rejected the word of the Lord. That is that revealed word. And now he's rejected you from being king. Here's what kept, here's what caused Samuel to weep all night for many nights. Separation. In 1 Samuel 15, 26, Samuel said to Saul, because he hasn't got a choice, I will not return with you. You know what that is? That's separation. You know why? Because, listen, Samuel wants to be holy, and he can't be holy with, with this unholy person. He wants to be holy, and this guy will drag him down. This guy will ruin that for his life. You understand that, don't you? So we're told to do that. It, we're told at some point, separate yourself from him. Separate yourself. But listen, he tells you that. What, 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 what does light have with darkness? Now, you may be in a situation that you can't separate. You might be in a sit situation where you've got a child or you've got a mate. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 7. 
who are willing to stay in there and not push the buttons on you all the time. You understand that? You need to read that if you don't. I will not return with you. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 7, and 1 Peter 4 is a really good example. 1 Peter 4, 2 through 4 is what I read to teenagers all the time because they're peer level oriented, not parent level oriented. And it's really difficult, parents, to keep them parent oriented once they get peer oriented. It's really difficult. Listen to me, though. It's not impossible, and you may sp have to spend some nights on your knees praying and weeping for them. I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you. And so in the 16th chapter, verse 14, we see the discipline. I mean, God has, God has got Samuel right here. Saul is connected with Samuel. God is speaking to Samuel because Saul is still open to listen to Samuel. But he's, listen, Saul is not obedient to what he's telling them, but at least he's got an ear. Listen, you're, you still got ministry when you have an ear. At some point, you won't have that. But there's still hope when you have it. And Samuel believed that. But Saul wouldn't do it. And so when we get to chapter 16, verse 14, the Lord withdrew the Holy Spirit from him. It says, now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Isn't God kind? I mean, he didn't do it in a split second. He gave him plenty of time, as time goes, to confess his sin and, 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 and make his journey back. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and guess what took his place? The Spirit of the world. The Spirit of the world. See, that's what you, listen, that's what you have before you get saved. But listen, when you go, when you go back to that place, it's a lot worse. And listen, the rest of the life from chapter 16 until Saul dies, this is what you see out of his life. You're not going to see the spirit of God work in his life. You're going to see the evil spirit work in his life. You're going to see the spirit of the world of the sons of disobedience. You know that, you know, in Ephesians, the second chapter? There you are. And that's what you're going to see. That's what we saw in his life. Now listen. I, I need to make sure that you understand that you and I live in the church age, a completely different dispensation with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And John 14, 16 says he can never leave you. Once he takes a residence in your life, he can never leave you. Jesus himself spoke that. So you are never going to have the experience he had. You understand that? That's important you understand that. Now, here is a, a definition of reversionism that I've put together based on what we have seen in the life of Saul so that we can go back to a passage and take a look at this definition and see it in the life of somebody that we've met. Reversion is retrogression. Retrogression, instead of progression, is retrogression from any stage of spiritual growth because of a pattern of old man cosmos diabolicus thinking that's pretty obvious that Saul is eat up with it, like all of us. The Word of God is what changes us by the renewing of our mind, agreed? The pattern of old man cosmos diabolicus thinking expressed, expressed through negative volition, rebellion, rejection of the revealed directive will of God, and evil in the sight of God. Do you understand that? We've, we've just seen all this. So there's a definition based on Saul, reversionism, out of, first, out of 1 Samuel 15. Here's the second point. Saul went to war, defeated the Amalekites, while at the same time lost the most important internal warfare, the spiritual war of the angelic conflict. Is that not crazy? Listen, he went out and fought a battle, won a war, 
on the outside and lost the biggest battle of his life, which is the Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God and do battle. He lost that one while winning the other one. Let me tell you, the war you must always win is the internal war of the angelic conflict. The other stuff, that's incidental. If you lose this one, it doesn't matter what you've won out there. Hello, Saul. First Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 8 through 10. The devil, like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Be sure it's not you. But you got to be on guard. Listen, who would go? Who would go to Africa on a safari? And they show you films about what's out there, and you're not on your toes all the time. You're outside the jeep or whatever you're in. I mean, I wouldn't even drive through a a, a zoo where the animals can come up and. You got to be on your toes. Listen, we're in a we're in a war. Be sure you listen. You win the wars out here, and listen. I see marriages all the time. The war is won out here and lost in here. I see it in families. Won out here, lost in here. I used to have a Bible study that just clicked in my head. I had one in Penson on one night of the week, like, I don't remember. And then I went across town to uh, Mountain Brook and had another Bible study. I had one on this side of town and I had one on that side of town. Out there in Penson, all te teenagers, high school kids. I mean, I was always battling with them about drinking because you're not of age. It's against the law. You shouldn't be doing it. I was always dealing with about sex. I was always dealing about this, dealing about that. And, you know, people have like, well, what do you expect? That's Pinson. <laughs> the difference is, is that that's my people, you know, <laughs> I knew those guys. I'd drive all over Cuss Town, uh, the half Luton people. You know, it's not my kids. And that's what I heard all the time. Their kids were absolutely as bad, if not worse. You know why? It, well, listen, no, it's, it's sin. It's just sin. It's a sin nature. It's just sin. It doesn't matter if you're out there or over there. It doesn't matter if you live in a, a, a $10,000 house or, or $200,000 house. Sin is sin, man. It, the problem was the way the parents dealt with it. Parents out and they were, yeah, I know. I just, oh, yeah, I'm after him. I mean, I'll tell you, he does that, I'll pound him. Over there, not my kids. Oh, no, my kids. not my kids. And I, and I never could convince them that sin is sin and everybody has a sin. I never could convince them of that. So, you know, I just went and delivered the mail. My job is to deliver the mail, not change people's lives. So I just delivered the mail to both people. But I was a lot more comfortable out there than I was over there with people in denial. I can't take denial. That just about drives me nuts. For, First John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Listen to that safeguard. The, you can't afford to lose the internal war because greater is he who is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, than the devil who is in the world. You can't afford to lose this one. You can afford to lose those wars out there and not lose that one in there, right? I'm fired up tonight. What's going on here? Amen. Fired up. Must be for somebody on the internet. The spiritually advancing believer is, listen, you're never neutral. 
You are never neutral. You're either in the flesh or in the spirit. You're either walking by faith or walking by sight. You're either, listen to me now, because you're not going to like this. You're either walking in the will of God or you're walking in the will of Satan. They're, these are not neutral. Isn't it like a, a little, little piece of ice someplace and floating in a... This is, this is, In 2 Timothy 2.26, it tells you that. And it's interesting the way Paul lays this thing out to Timothy about the will of Satan. We act like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, let me spend a little time with you and I can explain that out of your own life. And that they may come to their senses. You remember the, you remember the, the prodigal son? Remember, I was, um, listen, you know how important it is to come to your senses? You know why? Because you're losing the internal war. I don't care what you went on the outside. If you lose that one, it's, it's a. Uh, so he says that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. You know, you can't, you can't, listen. I, I've been to the Jimmy Hill Mission. I've been to the Salvation Army. I've been everywhere you can go to talk to people about the Lord. And I can tell you this principle. If you can't get them to their senses, they can't get out of the snare of the devil. They're trapped into something they can never get out of because they can never come to their senses. Let me tell you, if you want out of your addiction, if you want out of your bondage, you've got to come to your senses and you've got to be willing to let the Lord deliver you. Jeez, the snare of the devil, having been, listen, having been held captive by him to do his will. Listen, and boy, if you think he's not bold, he walks up to Jesus face to face in Matthew 4 and challenges him. Will you follow the will of God or mine? I got a sweet deal here for you. You have, listen, let me tell you, I believe you're the son of God. I heard a guy the other day preaching on the ifs in Matthew 4. It drove me nuts. Because he used them as a third class condition. The devil didn't say, if you are or if you're not. He, he, listen, he's not that stupid. He said, we both know that you're the son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We all know that. That's, that's a given. Let me see you do your stuff. If you, if, if, if you are who we both know you are, then let's see you do your stuff. Turn the stone into bread. You know how he fought him? With the word of God. He fought him with category, listen, not with the Bible. He didn't pick the Bible up and slap him side the head. The Satan's smarter about the Bible than you'll ever be. You know why? Because he's lived longer. He's not an idiot. He's lived longer. I mean, he's got you outwitted every day of your life if you go to the world. If you get in the world arena, he's smarter than a whip and you're dumb. He's just been there longer. He's fought this fought many a time. The only way you can, only way you can win over the world is in Christ. I mean, he's conquered the world. First uh, John 5, 4. Faith is a victory that overcomes the what? Well, that's bigger than your life. I mean, that's bigger than your life. I mean, he's big enough to win it over your life, your family's life, your family families, your neighborhood, your state, your nation, the world, man. <laughs> the world. My, my faith over the world. Come on. Jeez. So there's a conflict of wills. Reversionism, this conflict of wills becomes very clear. It's not hidden. It's not under the rug. It's out in the open. The conflict of wills. And this is important. And so I gave you a bunch of scriptures. One of the things you have to be aware of is 2 Corinthians 11 where he says, let me tell you how tricky the devil is. He's a disguise master. And, and, and what he does, he appears as an angel of light. 
and feed you darkness. That's false teaching. I gave you a bunch of passages of well worth your time. And so, you know, you, you, here's constantly. You say to a person like Saul, like Samuel and Saul, Samuel trying to minister to Saul to try to get him to come to his senses. That's the best you can do in counseling is to bring him to their senses. And so you, you're always asking or thinking when you're dealing with people like this, what could, what could a believer possibly gain by rejecting the will of God? Yeah, they all do it. That's why their life is in a mess, and that's why they want help. And you, you ask them, look, you, ha you have allowed the devil to ruin your life. You have just run the rabbit trails with him, and he has destroyed. He's destroyed your way to think. He's destroyed everything about your life. What could you possibly gain by rejecting the will of God? Well, with Saul, he had this overwhelming need for approval. You know, I'm this wee little man, and the wee little man was I. And he, listen, he carried that to the grave. His only hope was once he got saved and got indwelt by the Holy Spirit or, or under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and Samuel, this great pastor teacher, entered into his life, he had a real shot at change if he would renew his mind. And he didn't have a dog's chance if he didn't. And there you go. And so you have this, you have, you have this thing in, 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 in Samuel... 15. Listen, it happened to Eve in the third chapter of Genesis. You know what he told her? <laughs> this is hard to believe. She, I mean, listen, some fish will bite for anything. You know, when we would run out, we would catch a fish and we'd pop their eyes out, right? And use a fish bait, right? I mean, we, we would gut them open and take some little fish with anything that we could keep on fishing once they were biting. Listen, once you get biting, you think you can get them all. All right? So, listen, you know how he got her? Listen to how he got her. I mean, how, this is a line you go like, sweetheart, you didn't fall for that line, did you? Uh, uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Listen, he says, if you eat, listen. Now, you're not going to hear this from other people, but listen. Come in here. She would never do that in Bible study. But he's got something to tell her. If you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. You won't need a tree anymore. You will be the tree, baby. And you'll just leaf out everywhere and you'll be so smart. You know it all. You'll be like God. Girls, it amazes me what you fall for. But that's a line that's pretty hard to swallow, isn't it? Did she swallow it? Yeah. Hook, line, and sinker. And you know where she got that idea? He got it from him in Isaiah 14, 14, who he thought he would overthrow and become God. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Hey, look, you know, we quote Romans 12, 2 all the time. Look at 12, 1. I'll show you 12 1. Good. The, the devil likes to run this stuff. Well, watch 12 1. This is important. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. Now, Paul talks a lot about that, doesn't he? That must be a big deal. Listen, we don't think so. We haven't bought into this idea, but Paul thinks it. 
because your body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there and your body is a whole different ball game now. Paul believes that even though you don't. Oh, I've heard it, Ron. I know. Oh, I know you heard it because we say it a lot. Listen, to present your bodies, to present your bodies, to present your bodies, mm, to present your bodies. Come on now, to present your bodies, to present your bodies, to present your bodies. Ah, uh, you're not getting it. To present your bodies. To present your body. Who's you presenting them to? And how are we going to present them? As a living, holy sacrifice. Acceptable to God. Watch this now. Which is your spiritual service of worship. You know, everybody talks about worship. Worship, worship, worship. Oh, I love this church because they, 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 they were, I love their worship service. Well, what's it consist of? Singing. Oh, that's good. That's good. Can I tell you something else about worship that you may have not thought about? Romans 12, 1. How about that? How about learning to present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice acceptable to God? Whoa, 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 whoa. Watch this now. Which is your, which is your, which is your spiritual service of worship. And how do I do that? Then verse 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that it is good, acceptable, and perfect. There it is. Whew. Try that on for worship. Try that on for worship. This says, listen, I'll tell you what's important about worship. The Word of God. The Word of God. Let me tell you, you're not going to get into any worship that God considers worship till you get into the Word and worship. Where do you get that, Ron Adama? Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, for starts. As soon as people find that, they'll rip that out. I don't like that. Don't like that one, Ron. In 1 Peter 1.14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, O man, o man cosmos diabolicus, as obedient children, as obedient children to the will of God, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. Not anymore. Not anymore. That ignorance part is not anymore. Stay here one year with me. It's not anymore. Well, I'm thinking about those that are visiting with the internet. Pick out a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Sunday, and stay with me a year on that one day. Quit flopping all over the place. You ain't going to grow that way. Get you a night. Stick with me for one year. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in ignorance, in which you formerly walked, now I'm in Ephesians, in which you formerly walked, now watch this, watch the words according to and then the words of. I bold printed them for you. In which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. You see that? Who are we talking about? The course of the world, the prince that runs it. Hey, listen, first... 1 John 5, 19, it's the devil, the God of this world is Satan. You formerly walked, everybody formerly walked there. Al, Al preaches that, that's, that's one of his pet ser sermons right there. You hear him say it once, he says it forever. He says everybody formerly walked. Everybody who's saved had a former walk. You didn't, come, you didn't get saved before you got, got, got born, Nicodemus. You formerly walked according to the course of the world. That's conformity to the world. That's the course of the world. That's conformity to the world. According to the prince of the power of the air. Watch this. According to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we 
to or formerly lived in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest of humanity. You know what? That's our former life. That's not our life now. All right. Well, I ran out of time. So you can read the rest of it. Point four and point five. It'd be well worth your read. Let me close in a word of prayer with you. For those who are attending with us in our classroom and those who are by with us by internet. Recovery. Recovery from rebellion against God. Insubordination to his revealed will in your life. What's recovery? It's twofold. First, confession of personal sin. At some point, you've got to start your journey back. And whatever that point is, whatever that sin is that he's got you on right now, confess it. First John 1 John 1.9. But I'm going to tell you, there's another part to this. And that is the renewed of your mind. Every time a person is in reversion, because what happens, you become dull of hearing, and you've got to come back and renew your mind. First uh, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. You've become dull of hearing, and now you've got to go back through uh, spiritual growth challenges. You've got to go back, and you've got to re re but listen to where you have to go back to. You've, and this was for Saul, and Saul wouldn't do it. You've got to go back where disobedience occurred. Now, for Saul... It was that details that said utterly destroy. Agreed? Listen, when he came home, when he said, I have sinned, of course, he didn't say it to the Lord. He said to Samuel, listen, you can confess your sin to me all day long. You better confess it to God. If you confess it to me all day long, you don't get anything. You confess it to God one time, you got, you got restoration. You're into recovery. Listen, but you've got to go back, and you gotta, you've got to fix it, so to speak. In the violation of the will. And so, listen, what he should have done, what he should have done is went, I have sinned, confessed it to the Lord, and then what he should, by renewing his mind, he should have went back to the will of God and made it right. You know, you know what he should have done? What should he have done? Yeah, he had all those, all those animals. The, oh, you know how much they're worth? Nothing. They're worth nothing. Done. Go out there and kill every one of them. What's the second thing he's supposed to do? He's got a king with him. He's got to kill the king. He wouldn't do that. He's in deep trouble. He wouldn't do that. Listen, not only did he need to confess his sin, he needed to complete the will of God. Do you understand that? Yeah. You know who had to do it? Who did it? Samuel. Samuel, the guy who set the mission in motion, had to go back and clean it up. Because the Lord gave that assignment to him as well. And he had to do it. Jonah. Jonah, in the first chapter, God gives him detailed instructions. Arise, go. Right? Arise, go to Nineveh. Um, cry against it and give them the solution. Give them the solution. Proclaim the gospel. That was the details. He didn't do it in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We get to chapter two and three, and he and he chapter two he repents, right? I mean he he confesses his sin and changes his mind. And as soon as he gets off the boat or out of the whale, as soon as he gets out of the whale, we got chapter three verses one and two. You know what the father tells him? Exactly what he failed. He told him the same thing in chap in chapter three verses one and two. He told him the same thing he told him verses one and two. This is what he th and this is part of your recovery. This is the renewing of your mind. This is where you get back on track. If you don't do it, you won't get back on track. Reversionism is a big deal. And so for those who are with me and those who are with me in the internet, you need to understand that. You need to understand. You need to read Hebrews, the third chapter, the fourth chapter, and the fifth chapter before you drop this subject. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way, both by automobile and the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. 
be able to fill all the gaps that I have with it, bring it to the reality of the Christian life. This is what is missing in America. This is what's missing across the world in Christian churches. I pray, Father, that we would understand how serious this is in a, in a Christian's life. This is not some casual thing. This is a big deal. You can see how God had to deal with it and how he deals with it all the way down the pike. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.